Cratylus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Cratylus by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Part 1. Persons of the Dialogue. Socrates. Hermogenes. Cratylus. Hermogenes. Suppose that we make Socrates a party to the argument. Cratylus. If you please. Hermogenes. I should explain to you, Socrates, that our friend Cratylus has been arguing about names. He says that they are natural and not conventional, not a portion of the human voice which men agree to use, but that there is a truth or correctness in them which is the same for Hellenes as for barbarians, whereupon I ask him whether his own name of Cratylus is a true name or not, and he answers, yes. And Socrates? Yes. Then every man's name, as I tell him, is that which he is called? To this he replies, If all the world were to call you Hermogenes, that would not be your name. And when I am anxious to have a further explanation, he is ironical and mysterious, and seems to imply that he has a notion of his own about the matter, if he would only tell, and could entirely convince me if he chose to be intelligible. Tell me, Socrates, what this oracle means, or rather tell me, if you will be so good, what is your own view of the truth or correctness of names, which I would far sooner hear? Socrates, son of Hipponicus, there is an ancient saying that hard is the knowledge of the good, and the knowledge of names is a great part of knowledge. If I had not been poor, I might have heard the fifty drachma course of the great Prodicus, which is a complete education in grammar and language. These are his own words, and then I should have been at once able to answer your question about the correctness of names. But, indeed, I have only heard the single drachma course, and therefore I do not know the truth about such matters. I will, however, gladly assist you and Cratylus in the investigation of them. When he declares that your name is not really Hermogenes, I suspect that he is only making fun of you. He means to say that you are no true son of Hermes, because you are always looking after a fortune, and never in luck. But, as I was saying, there is a good deal of difficulty in this sort of knowledge, and therefore we had better leave the question open until we have heard both sides. Hermogenes, I have often talked over this matter, both with Cratylus and others, and cannot convince myself that there is any principle of correctness in names other than convention and agreement. Any name which you give, in my opinion, is the right one, and if you change that and give another, the new name is as correct as the old. We frequently change the names of our slaves, and the newly imposed name is as good as the old, for there is no name given to anything by nature. All is convention and habit of the users. Such is my view. But if I am mistaken, I shall be happy to hear and learn of Cratylus, or of any one else. Socrates, I dare say that you may be right, Hermogenes. Let us see. Your meaning is that the name of each thing is only that which anybody agrees to call it? Hermogenes, that is my notion. Socrates, whether the giver of the name be an individual or a city? Hermogenes, yes. Socrates, well now, let me take an instance. Suppose that I call a man a horse, or a horse a man. You mean to say that a man will be rightly called a horse by me individually, and rightly called a man by the rest of the world? And a horse again would be rightly called a man by me, and a horse by the world? That is your meaning? Hermogenes, he would, according to my view. Socrates, but how about truth, then? You would acknowledge that there is in words a true and a false? Hermogenes, certainly. Socrates, and there are true and false propositions? Hermogenes, to be sure. Socrates, and a true proposition says that which is, and a false proposition says that which is not? Hermogenes, yes. What other answer is possible? Socrates. 
then in a proposition there is a true and false hermogenes certainly socrates but is a proposition true as a whole only and are the parts untrue hermogenes no the parts are true as well as the whole socrates would you say the large parts and not the smaller ones or every part hermogenes i should say that every part is true socrates is a proposition resolvable into any part smaller than a name hermogenes no that is the smallest socrates then the name is a part of the true proposition hermogenes yes socrates yes and a true part as you say hermogenes yes socrates and is not the part of a falsehood also a falsehood hermogenes yes socrates then if propositions may be true and false names may be true and false hermogenes so we must infer socrates and the name of anything is that which any one affirms to be the name hermogenes yes socrates and will there be so many names of each thing as everybody says that there are and will they be true names at the time of uttering them hermogenes yes socrates i can conceive no correctness of names other than this you give one name and i another and in different cities and countries there are different names for the same things hellenes differ from barbarians in their use of names and the several hellenic tribes from one another socrates but would you say hermogenes that the things differ as the names differ and are they relative to individuals as protagoras tells us for he says that man is the measure of all things and that things are to me as they appear to me and that they are to you as they appear to you do you agree with him or would you say that things have a permanent essence of their own hermogenes there have been times socrates when i have been driven in my perplexity to take refuge with protagoras not that i agree with him at all socrates what have you ever been driven to admit that there was no such thing as a bad man hermogenes no indeed but i have often had reason to think that there are very bad men and a good many of them socrates well and have you ever found any very good ones hermogenes not many socrates still you have found them hermogenes yes socrates and would you hold that the very good were the very wise and the very evil very foolish would that be your view hermogenes it would socrates but if protagoras is right and the truth is that things are as they appear to any one how can some of us be wise and some of us foolish hermogenes impossible socrates and if on the other hand wisdom and folly are really distinguishable you will allow i think that the assertion of protagoras can hardly be correct for if what appears to each man is true to him one man cannot in reality be wiser than another hermogenes he cannot socrates nor will you be disposed to say with euthydemus that all things equally belong to all men at the same moment and always for neither on his view can there be some good and others bad if virtue and vice are always equally to be attributed to all hermogenes there cannot socrates but if neither is right and things are not relative to individuals and all things do not equally belong to all at the same moment and always they must be supposed to have their own proper and permanent essence they are not in relation to us or influenced by us fluctuating according to our fancy but they are independent and maintain to their own essence the relation prescribed by nature hermogenes i think socrates that you have said the truth socrates does what i am saying apply only to the things themselves or equally to the actions which proceed from them are not actions also a class of being hermogenes yes the actions are real as well as the things socrates then the actions also are done according to their proper nature and not according to our opinion of them in cutting for example we do not cut as we please and with any chance instrument but we cut with the proper instrument only and according to the natural process of cutting and the natural process is right and will succeed 
but any other will fail and be of no use at all hermogenes i should say that the natural way is the right way socrates again in burning not every way is the right way but the right way is the natural way and the right instrument the natural instrument hermogenes true socrates and this holds good of all actions hermogenes yes socrates and speech is a kind of action hermogenes true socrates and will a man speak correctly who speaks as he pleases will not the successful speaker rather be he who speaks in the natural way of speaking and as things ought to be spoken and with the natural instrument any other mode of speaking will result in error and failure hermogenes i quite agree with you socrates and is not naming a part of speaking for in giving names men speak hermogenes that is true socrates and if speaking is a sort of action and has a relation to acts is not naming also a sort of action hermogenes true socrates and we saw that actions were not relative to ourselves but had a special nature of their own hermogenes precisely socrates then the argument would lead us to infer that names ought to be given according to a natural process and with a proper instrument and not at our pleasure in this and no other way shall we name with success hermogenes i agree socrates but again that which has to be cut has to be cut with something hermogenes yes socrates and that which has to be woven or pierced has to be woven or pierced with something hermogenes certainly socrates and that which has to be named has to be named with something hermogenes true socrates what is that with which we pierce hermogenes an all socrates and with which we weave hermogenes a shuttle socrates and with which we name hermogenes a name socrates very good then a name is an instrument hermogenes certainly socrates suppose that i ask what sort of instrument is a shuttle and you answer a weaving instrument hermogenes well socrates and i ask again what do we do when we weave the answer is that we separate or disengage the warp from the woof hermogenes very true socrates and may not a similar description be given of an all and of instruments in general hermogenes to be sure socrates and now suppose that i ask a similar question about names will you answer me regarding the name as an instrument what do we do when we name hermogenes i cannot say socrates do we not give information to one another and distinguish things according to their natures hermogenes certainly we do socrates then a name is an instrument of teaching and of distinguishing natures as the shuttle is of distinguishing the threads of the web hermogenes yes socrates and the shuttle is the instrument of the weaver hermogenes assuredly socrates then the weaver will use the shuttle well and well means like a weaver and the teacher will use the name well and well means like a teacher hermogenes yes socrates and when the weaver uses the shuttle whose work will he be using well hermogenes that of the carpenter socrates and is every man a carpenter or the skilled only hermogenes only the skilled socrates and when the piercer uses the awl whose work will he be using well hermogenes that of the smith socrates and is every man a smith or only the skilled hermogenes the skilled only socrates and when the teacher uses the name whose work will he be using hermogenes there again i am puzzled socrates cannot you at least say who gives us the names which we use hermogenes indeed i cannot socrates does not the law seem to you to give us them hermogenes yes i suppose so socrates then the teacher when he gives us a name uses the work of the legislator hermogenes i agree socrates and is every man a legislator or the skilled only hermogenes the skilled only 
Socrates. Then, Hermogenes, not every man is able to give a name, but only a maker of names, and this is the legislator, who of all skilled artisans in the world is the rarest. Hermogenes. True. Socrates. And how does the legislator make names, and to what does he look? Consider this in the light of the previous instances. To what does the carpenter look in making the shuttle? Does he not look to that which is naturally fitted to act as a shuttle? Hermogenes. Certainly. Socrates. And suppose the shuttle to be broken in making. Will he make another, looking to the broken one, or will he look to the form according to which he made the other? Hermogenes. To the latter, I should imagine. Socrates. Might not that be justly called the true or ideal shuttle? Hermogenes. I think so. Socrates. And whatever shuttles are wanted for the manufacture of garments, thin or thick, of flaxen, woolen, or other material, ought all of them to have the true form of the shuttle, and whatever is the shuttle best adapted to each kind of work, that ought to be the form which the maker produces in each case. Hermogenes. Yes. Socrates. And the same holds of other instruments. When a man has discovered the instrument which is naturally adapted to each work, he must express this natural form, and not others which he fancies, in the material, whatever it may be which he employs. For example, he ought to know how to put into iron the forms of awls adapted by nature to their several uses. Hermogenes. Certainly. Socrates. And how to put into wood forms of shuttles adapted by nature to their uses. Hermogenes. True. Socrates. For the several forms of shuttles naturally answer to the several kinds of webs, and this is true of instruments in general. Hermogenes. Yes. Socrates. Then, as to names, ought not our legislator also to know how to put the true natural name of each thing into sounds and syllables, and to make and give all names with a view to the ideal name, if he is to be a namer in any true sense. And we must remember that different legislators will not use the same syllables, for neither does every smith, although he may be making the same instrument for the same purpose, make them all of the same iron. The form must be the same, but the material may vary, and still the instrument may be equally good of whatever iron made, whether in Hellas or in a foreign country. There is no difference. Hermogenes. Very true. Socrates. And the legislator, whether he be Hellene or barbarian, is not therefore to be deemed by you a worse legislator, provided he gives the true and proper form of the name in whatever syllables. This or that country makes no matter. Hermogenes. Quite true. Socrates. But who, then, is to determine whether the proper form is given to the shuttle, whatever sort of wood may be used, the carpenter who makes, or the weaver who is to use them? Hermogenes. I should say, he who is to use them, Socrates. Socrates. And who uses the work of the lyre-maker? Will not he be the man who knows how to direct what is being done, and who will know also whether the work is being well done or not? Hermogenes. Certainly. Socrates. And who is he? Hermogenes. The player of the lyre. Socrates. And who will direct the shipwright? Hermogenes. The pilot. Socrates. And who will be best able to direct the legislator in his work, and will know whether the work is well done in this or any other country? Will not the user be the man? Hermogenes. Yes. Socrates. And this is he who knows how to ask questions? Hermogenes. Yes. Socrates. And how to answer them? Hermogenes. Yes. Socrates. And him who knows how to ask and answer, you would call a dialectician? Hermogenes. Yes. That would be his name. Socrates. Then the work of the carpenter is to make a rudder, and the pilot has to direct him, if the rudder is to be well made? Hermogenes. True. Socrates. And the work of the legislator is to give names, and the dialectician must be his director, if the names are to be rightly given? Hermogenes. That is true. Socrates. Then, Hermogenes, I should imagine this giving of names to be no such light matter as you fancy, 
or the work of light or chance persons and cratylus is right in saying that things have names by nature and that not every man is an artificer of names but he only who looks to the name which each thing by nature has and is able to express the true forms of things in letters and syllables hermogenes i cannot answer you socrates but i find a difficulty in changing my opinion all in a moment and i think that i should be more readily persuaded if you would show me what this is which you term the natural fitness of names socrates my good hermogenes i have none to show was i not telling you just now but you have forgotten that i knew nothing and proposing to share the inquiry with you but now that you and i have talked over the matter a step has been gained for we have discovered that names have by nature a truth and that not every man knows how to give a thing a name hermogenes very good socrates and what is the nature of this truth or correctness of names that if you care to know is the next question hermogenes certainly i care to know socrates then reflect hermogenes how shall i reflect socrates the true way is to have the assistance of those who know and you must pay them well both in money and in thanks these are the sophists of whom your brother callias has rather dearly bought the reputation of wisdom but you have not yet come into your inheritance and therefore you had better go to him and beg and entreat him to tell you what he has learned from protagoras about the fitness of names hermogenes but how inconsistent should i be if whilst repudiating protagoras and his truth i were to attach any value to what he and his book affirm socrates then if you despise him you must learn of homer and the poets hermogenes and where does homer say anything about names and what does he say socrates he often speaks of them notably and nobly in the places where he distinguishes the different names which gods and men give to the same things does he not in these passages make a remarkable statement about the correctness of names for the gods must clearly be supposed to call things by their right and natural names do you not think so hermogenes why of course they call them rightly if they call them at all but to what are you referring socrates do you not know what he says about the river in troy who had a single combat with hephaestus whom as he says the gods call xanthus and men call scamander hermogenes i remember socrates well and about this river to know that he ought to be called xanthus and not scamander is not that a solemn lesson or about the bird which as he says the gods call chalces and men chimindus to be taught how much more correct the name chalces is than the name chimindus do you deem that a light matter or about batia and Myrina? and there are many other observations of the same kind in homer and other poets now i think that this is beyond the understanding of you and me but the names of scamandrius and astyanax which he affirms to have been the names of hector's son are more within the range of human faculties as i am disposed to think and what the poet means by correctness may be more readily apprehended in that instance you will remember i dare say the lines to which i refer hermogenes i do socrates let me ask you then which did homer think the more correct of the names given to hector's son astyanax or scamandrius hermogenes i do not know socrates how would you answer if you were asked whether the wise or the unwise are more likely to give correct names hermogenes i should say the wise of course socrates and are the men or the women of a city taken as a class the wiser hermogenes i should say the men socrates and homer as you know says that the trojan men called him astyanax king of the city but if the men called him astyanax the other name of scamandrius could only have been given to him by the women hermogenes that may be inferred 
Socrates, and must not Homer have imagined the Trojans to be wiser than their wives? Hermogenes, to be sure. Socrates, then he must have thought Astyanax to be a more correct name for the boy than Scamandrius. Hermogenes, clearly. Socrates, and what is the reason of this? Let us consider. Does he not himself suggest a very good reason when he says, for he alone defended their city and long walls. This appears to be a good reason for calling the son of the Saviour king of the city which his father was saving, as Homer observes. Hermogenes. I see. Socrates. Why, Hermogenes, I do not as yet see myself. And do you? Hermogenes. No, indeed, not I. Socrates. But tell me, friend, did not Homer himself also give Hector his name? Hermogenes, what of that? Socrates, the name appears to me to be very nearly the same as the name of Astyanax. Both are Hellenic, and a king, Anax, and a holder, Hector, have nearly the same meaning, and are both descriptive of a king, for a man is clearly the holder of that of which he is king. He rules, and owns, and holds it. But perhaps you may think that I am talking nonsense, and indeed I believe that I myself did not know what I meant when I imagined that I had found some indication of the opinion of Homer about the correctness of names. Hermogenes, I assure you that I think otherwise, and I believe you to be on the right track. Socrates, there is reason, I think, in calling the lion's whelp a lion, and the foal of a horse a horse. I am speaking only of the ordinary course of nature, when an animal produces after his kind, and not of extraordinary births. If contrary to nature a horse have a calf, then I should not call that a foal but a calf, nor do I call any inhuman birth a man, but only a natural birth, and the same may be said of trees and other things. Do you agree with me? Hermogenes. Yes, I agree. Socrates. Very good, but you had better watch me and see that I do not play tricks with you, for on the same principle the son of a king is to be called a king, and whether the syllables of the name are the same or not the same makes no difference, provided the meaning is retained, nor does the addition or subtraction of a letter make any difference so long as the essence of the thing remains in possession of the name and appears in it. Hermogenes what do you mean? Socrates, a very simple matter. I may illustrate my meaning by the names of letters, which you know are not the same as the letters themselves, with the exception of the four, e, u, a, a. The names of the rest, whether vowels or consonants, are made up of other letters, which we add to them, but so long as we introduce the meaning, and there can be no mistake, the name of the letter is quite correct. Take, for example, the letter beta. The addition of e, t, a gives no offence, and does not prevent the whole name from having the value which the legislator intended. So well did he know how to give the letters names. Hermogenes, I believe you are right. Socrates, and may not the same be said of a king? A king will often be the son of a king the good son or the noble son of a good or noble sire, and similarly the offspring of every kind, in the regular course of nature, is like the parent, and therefore has the same name. Yet the syllables may be disguised until they appear different to the ignorant person, and he may not recognize them, although they are the same, just as any one of us would not recognize the same drugs under different disguises of color and smell, although to the physician, who regards the power of them, they are the same, and he is not put out by the addition, and in like manner the etymologist is not put out by the addition, or transposition, or subtraction of a letter or two, or indeed by the change of all the letters, for this need not interfere with the meaning. As was just now said, the names of Hector and Astyanax have only one letter alike, which is the tau, and yet they have the same meaning, and 
how little in common with the letters of their names has archepolis ruler of the city and yet the meaning is the same and there are many other names which just mean king again there are several names for a general as for example agis leader and polemarchus chief in war and eupolemus good warrior and others which denote a physician as iatroclus famous healer and akesimbrotos curer of mortals and there are many others which might be cited differing in their syllables and letters but having the same meaning would you not say so hermogenes yes socrates the same names then ought to be assigned to those who follow in the course of nature hermogenes yes socrates and what of those who follow out of the course of nature and are prodigies for example when a good and religious man has an irreligious son he ought to bear the name not of his father but of the class to which he belongs just as in the case which was before supposed of a horse foaling a calf hermogenes quite true socrates then the irreligious son of a religious father should be called irreligious hermogenes certainly socrates he should not be called theophilus beloved of god or menestheus mindful of god or any of these names if names are correctly given his should have an opposite meaning hermogenes certainly socrates socrates again hermogenes there is orestes the man of the mountains who appears to be rightly called whether chance gave the name or perhaps some poet who meant to express the brutality and fierceness and mountain wildness of his hero's nature hermogenes that is very likely socrates socrates and his father's name is also according to nature hermogenes clearly socrates yes for as his name so also is his nature agamemnon admirable for remaining is one who is patient and persevering in the accomplishment of his resolves and by his virtue crowns them and his continuance at troy with all the vast army is a proof of that admirable endurance in him which is signified by the name agamemnon i also think that atreus is rightly called for his murder of chrysippus and his exceeding cruelty to thyestes are damaging and destructive to his reputation the name is a little altered and disguised so as not to be intelligible to every one but to the etymologist there is no difficulty in seeing the meaning for whether you think of him as atires the stubborn or as atrestos the fearless or as atheros the destructive one the name is perfectly correct in every point of view and i think that pelops is also named appropriately for as the name implies he is rightly called pelops who sees what is near only otapelos oron hermogenes how so socrates because according to the tradition he had no forethought or foresight of all the evil which the murder of Murtilus would entail upon his whole race in remote ages he saw only what was at hand and immediate or in other words pelus near in his eagerness to win hippodamia by all means for his bride every one would agree that the name of tantalus is rightly given and in accordance with nature if the traditions about him are true hermogenes and what are the traditions socrates many terrible misfortunes are said to have happened to him in his life last of all came the utter ruin of his country and after his death he had the stone suspended talentia over his head in the world below all this agrees wonderfully well with his name you might imagine that some person who wanted to call him talentatos the most weighed down by misfortune disguised the name by altering it into tantalus and into this form by some accident of tradition it has actually been transmuted the name of zeus who is his alleged father has also an excellent meaning although hard to be understood because really like a sentence which is divided into two parts for some call him zena 
and use the one half, and others who use the other half call him dia. The two together signify the nature of the god, and the business of a name, as we were saying, is to express the nature. For there is none who is more the author of life to us and to all than the lord and king of all. Wherefore we are right in calling him Zena and Dia, which are one name, although divided, meaning the god through whom all creatures always have life. Dion zen ai pasi tois zosin uparki. There is an irreverence at first sight in calling him son of Cronus, who is a proverb for stupidity, and we might rather expect Zeus to be the child of a mighty intellect, which is the fact, for this is the meaning of his father's name, Cronos, quasi, koros, korea, to sweep not in the sense of a youth, but signifying to katharan kai akeraton tu nu, the pure and garnished mind, skiliket apo tu korin. He, as we are informed by tradition, was begotten of Uranus, rightly so called apa tu oranta ana, from looking upwards, which, as philosophers tell us, is the way to have a pure mind, and the name Uranus is therefore correct. If I could remember the genealogy of Hesiod, I would have gone on and tried more conclusions of the same sort on the remoter ancestors of the gods. Then I might have seen whether this wisdom, which has come to me all in an instant, I know not whence, will or will not hold good to the end. Hermogenes you seem to me, Socrates, to be quite like a prophet, newly inspired, and to be uttering oracles. Socrates. Yes, Hermogenes, and I believe that I caught the inspiration from the great Euthyphro of the Prospulsion Deem, who gave me a long lecture which commenced at dawn. He talked, and I listened, and his wisdom and enchanting ravishment has not only filled my ears, but taken possession of my soul, and to-day I shall let his superhuman power work and finish the investigation of names. That will be the thing to do. But to-morrow, if you are so disposed, we will conjure him away, and make a purgation of him, if we can only find some priest or sophist who is skilled in purifications of this sort. Hermogenes, with all my heart, for I am very curious to hear the rest of the inquiry about names. End of part one recording in memory of mitchell edwards part two of cratylus by plato translated by benjamin joet this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jeffrey edwards Socrates. Then let us proceed. And where would you have us begin, now that we have got a sort of outline of the inquiry? Are there any names which witness of themselves that they are not given arbitrarily, but have a natural fitness? The names of heroes and of men in general are apt to be deceptive, because they are often called after ancestors with whose names, as we were saying, they may have no business or they are the expression of a wish, like Eurycides, the son of good fortune, or Sosius, the saviour, or Theophilus, the beloved of God, and others. But I think that we had better leave these, for there will be more chance of finding correctness in the names of immutable essences. There ought to have been more care taken about them when they were named, and perhaps there may have been some more than human power at work occasionally in giving them names. Hermogenes. I think so, Socrates. Socrates. Ought we not to begin with the consideration of the gods, and show that they are rightly named gods? Hermogenes. Yes, that will be well. Socrates. My notion would be something of this sort. I suspect that the sun, moon, earth, stars, and heaven, which are still the gods of many barbarians, were the only gods known to the aboriginal Hellenes. 
seeing that they were always moving and running from their running nature they were called gods or runners theus theontus and when men became acquainted with the other gods they proceeded to apply the same name to them all do you think that likely hermogenes i think it very likely indeed socrates what shall follow the gods hermogenes must not demons and heroes and men come next socrates demons and what do you consider to be the meaning of this word tell me if my view is right hermogenes let me hear socrates you know how hesiod uses the word hermogenes i do not socrates do you not remember that he speaks of a golden race of men who came first hermogenes yes i do socrates he says of them but now that fate has closed over this race they are holy demons upon the earth beneficent averters of ills guardians of mortal men hermogenes what is the inference socrates what is the inference why i suppose that he means by the golden men not men literally made of gold but good and noble and i am convinced of this because he further says that we are the iron race hermogenes very true socrates and do you not suppose that good men of our own day would by him be said to be of golden race hermogenes very likely socrates and are not the good wise hermogenes yes they are wise socrates and therefore i have the most entire conviction that he called them demons because they were demones knowing or wise and in our older attic dialect the word itself occurs now he and other poets say truly that when a good man dies he has honour and a mighty portion among the dead and becomes a demon which is a name given to him signifying wisdom and i say too that every wise man who happens to be a good man is more than human daimonion both in life and death and is rightly called a demon hermogenes then i rather think that i am of one mind with you but what is the meaning of the word hero heros in the old writing heros socrates i think that there is no difficulty in explaining for the name is not much altered and signifies that they were born of love hermogenes what do you mean socrates do you not know that the heroes are demigods hermogenes what then socrates all of them sprang either from the love of a god for a mortal woman or of a mortal man for a goddess think of the word in the old attic and you will see better that the name heros is only a slight alteration of eros from whom the hero sprang either this is the meaning or if not this then they must have been skilful as rhetoricians and dialecticians and able to put the question eratan for eden is equivalent to legen and therefore as i was saying in the attic dialect the heroes turn out to be rhetoricians and questioners all this is easy enough the noble breed of heroes are a tribe of sophists and rhetors but can you tell me why men are called anthropoi that is more difficult hermogenes no i cannot and i would not try even if i could because i think that you are the more likely to succeed socrates that is to say you trust to the inspiration of euthyphro hermogenes of course socrates your faith is not vain for at this very moment a new and ingenious thought strikes me and if i am not careful before to-morrow's dawn i shall be wiser than i ought to be now attend to me and first remember that we often put in and pull out letters and words and give names as we please and change the accents take for example the word di philos in order to convert this from a sentence into a noun we omit one of the iotas and sound the middle syllable grave instead of acute as on the other hand letters are sometimes inserted in words instead of being omitted and the acute takes the place of the grave hermogenes that is true socrates the name anthropos 
which was once a sentence and is now a noun appears to be a case just of this sort for one letter which is the alpha has been omitted and the acute on the last syllable has been changed to a grave hermogenes what do you mean socrates i mean to say that the word man implies that other animals never examine or consider or look up at what they see but that man not only sees opape but considers and looks up at that which he sees and hence he alone of all animals is rightly called anthropos meaning anathron ha opape hermogenes may i ask you to examine another word about which i am curious socrates certainly hermogenes i will take that which appears to me to follow next in order you know the distinction of soul and body socrates of course hermogenes let us endeavor to analyze them like the previous words socrates you want me first of all to examine the natural fitness of the word psuche soul and then of the word sama body hermogenes yes socrates if i am to say what occurs to me at the moment i should imagine that those who first used the name psuche meant to express that the soul when in the body is the source of life and gives the power of breath and revival anapsukon and when this reviving power fails then the body perishes and dies and this if i am not mistaken they called psyche but please stay a moment i fancy that i can discover something which will be more acceptable to the disciples of euthyphro for i am afraid that they will scorn this explanation what do you say to another hermogenes let me hear socrates what is that which holds and carries and gives life and motion to the entire nature of the body what else but the soul hermogenes just that socrates and do you not believe with anaxagoras that mind or soul is the ordering and containing principle of all things hermogenes yes i do socrates then you may well call that power pusake which carries and holds nature he pusin oke kai eke and this may be refined away into psuke hermogenes certainly and this derivation is i think more scientific than the other socrates it is so but i cannot help laughing if i am to suppose that this was the true meaning of the name hermogenes but what shall we say of the next word socrates you mean sama the body hermogenes yes socrates that may be variously interpreted and yet more variously if a little permutation is allowed for some say that the body is the grave sema of the soul which may be thought to be buried in our present life or again the index of the soul because the soul gives indications to semine the body probably the orphic poets were the inventors of the name and they were under the impression that the soul is suffering the punishment of sin and that the body is an enclosure or prison in which the soul is incarcerated kept safe sama sazetai as the name sama implies until the penalty is paid according to this view not even a letter of the word need be changed hermogenes i think socrates that we have said enough of this class of words but have we any more explanations of the names of the gods like that which you were giving of zeus i should like to know whether any similar principle of correctness is to be applied to them socrates yes indeed hermogenes and there is one excellent principle which as men of sense we must acknowledge that of the gods we know nothing either of their natures or of the names which they give themselves but we are sure that the names by which they call themselves whatever they may be are true and this is the best of all principles and the next best is to say as in prayers that we will call them by any sort or kind of names or patronymics which they like because we do not know of any other that also i think is a very good custom and one which i should much wish to observe 
let us then if you please in the first place announce to them that we are not inquiring about them we do not presume that we are able to do so but we are inquiring about the meaning of men in giving them these names in this there can be small blame hermogenes i think socrates that you are quite right and i would like to do as you say socrates shall we begin then with hestia according to custom hermogenes yes that will be very proper socrates what may we suppose him to have meant who gave the name hestia hermogenes that is another and certainly a most difficult question socrates my dear hermogenes the first imposers of names must surely have been considerable persons they were philosophers and had a good deal to say hermogenes well and what of them socrates they are the men to whom i should attribute the imposition of names even in foreign names if you analyze them a meaning is still discernible for example that which we term usia is by some called essia and by others again osia now that the essence of things should be called hestia which is akin to the first of these essia equals hestia is rational enough and there is reason in the athenians calling that hestia which participates in usia for in ancient times we too seem to have said essia for usia and this you may note to have been the idea of those who appointed that sacrifices should be first offered to hestia which was natural enough if they meant that hestia was the essence of things those again who read osia seem to have inclined to the opinion of heraclitus that all things flow and nothing stands with them the pushing principle Othun, is the cause and ruling power of all things and is therefore rightly called osia enough of this which is all that we who know nothing can affirm next in order after hestia we ought to consider rhea and cronus although the name of cronus has been already discussed but i dare say that i am talking great nonsense hermogenes why socrates socrates my good friend i have discovered a hive of wisdom hermogenes of what nature socrates well rather ridiculous and yet plausible hermogenes how plausible socrates i fancy to myself heraclitus repeating wise traditions of antiquity as old as the days of cronus and rhea and of which homer also spoke hermogenes how do you mean socrates heraclitus is supposed to say that all things are in motion and nothing at rest he compares them to the stream of a river and says that you cannot go into the same water twice hermogenes that is true socrates well then how can we avoid inferring that he who gave the names of cronus and rhea to the ancestors of the gods agreed pretty much in the doctrine of heraclitus is the giving of the names of streams to both of them purely accidental compare the line in which homer and as i believe hesiod also tells of ocean the origin of gods and mother tethys and again orpheus says that the fair river of ocean was the first to marry and he espoused his sister tethys who was his mother's daughter you see that this is a remarkable coincidence and all in the direction of heraclitus hermogenes i think that there is something in what you say socrates but i do not understand the meaning of the name tethys socrates well that is almost self-explained being only the name of a spring a little disguised for that which is strained and filtered diatomenon ethumenon may be likened to a spring and the name tethys is made up of these two words hermogenes the idea is ingenious socrates socrates to be sure but what comes next of zeus we have spoken hermogenes yes socrates then let us next take his two brothers poseidon and pluto whether the latter is called by that or by his other name hermogenes by all means socrates 
Poseidon is Posidismos, the chain of the feet. The original inventor of the name had been stopped by the watery element in his walks, and not allowed to go on, and therefore he called the ruler of this element Poseidon. The Epsilon was probably inserted as an ornament. Yet perhaps not so, but the name may have been originally written with a double lambda, and not with an sigma, meaning that the god knew many things, pola, edos, and perhaps also he, being the shaker of the earth, has been named from shaking, sane, and then pi and delta have been added. Pluto gives wealth, plutos, and his name means the giver of wealth, which comes out of the earth beneath. People in general appear to imagine that the term Hades is connected with the invisible, Aedes, and so they are led by their fears to call the god Pluto instead. Hermogenes. And what is the true derivation? Socrates. In spite of the mistakes which are made about the power of this deity, and the foolish fears which people have of him, such as the fear of always being with him after death, and of the soul denuded of the body going to him, my belief is that all is quite consistent, and that the office and name of the god really correspond. Hermogenes. Why, how is that? Socrates. I will tell you my own opinion, but first I should like to ask you which chain does any animal feel to be the stronger, and which confines him more to the same spot? desire or necessity. Hermogenes, desire, Socrates, is stronger, far. Socrates, and do you not think that many a one would escape from Hades if he did not bind those who depart to him by the strongest of chains? Hermogenes, assuredly they would. Socrates, and if by the greatest of chains, then by some desire? As I should certainly infer, and not by necessity? Hermogenes, clearly, Socrates. And there are many desires? Hermogenes. Yes. Socrates. And therefore by the greatest desire, if the chain is to be the greatest? Hermogenes. Yes. Socrates. And is any desire stronger than the thought that you will be made better by associating with another? Hermogenes. Certainly not. Socrates. And is not that the reason, Hermogenes, why no one who has been to him is willing to come back to us? Even the sirens, like all the rest of the world, have been laid under his spells. Such a charm, as I imagine, is the god able to infuse into his words. And, according to this view, he is the perfect and accomplished sophist, and the great benefactor of the inhabitants of the other world. And, even to us who are upon earth, he sends from below exceeding blessings. For he has much more than he wants down there, wherefore, he is called Pluto, or the rich. But he will have nothing to do with men while they are in the body, only when the soul is liberated from the desires and evils of the body has he communion with them. Is there not a great deal of philosophy and reflection in this? For in their liberated state he can bind them with the desire of virtue, but while they are flustered and maddened by the body, not even Father Cronus himself would suffice to keep them with him in his own far-famed chains. Hermogenes. There is a deal of truth in what you say. Socrates. Yes, Hermogenes, and the legislator called him Hades, not from the unseen, Aedes, far otherwise, but from his knowledge, Aedonai, of all noble things. Hermogenes. Very good. And what do we say of Demeter and Hera? and Apollo, and Athene, and Hephaestus, and Ares, and the other deities. Socrates. Demeter is so called because she gives food like a mother. He didusa meter. Hera is the lovely one, Erate, for Zeus, according to tradition, loved and married her. Possibly also the name may have been given when the legislator was thinking of the heavens, and may be only a disguise of the air, air, putting the end in the place of the beginning. You will recognize the truth of this if you repeat the letters of Hera several times over. People dread the name of Peripata, as they dread the name of Apollo, 
and with as little reason the fear if i am not mistaken only arises from their ignorance of the nature of names but they go changing the name into persephone and they are terrified at this whereas the new name means only that the goddess is wise sope for seeing that all things in the world are in motion peromenon that principle which embraces and touches and is able to follow them is wisdom and therefore the goddess may be truly called perepape perepapa or some name like it because she touches that which is in motion to peremenu epaptomene herein showing her wisdom and hades who is wise consorts with her because she is wise they alter her name into perepata nowadays because the present generation care for euphony more than truth there is the other name apollo which as i was saying is generally supposed to have some terrible signification have you remarked this fact hermogenes to be sure i have and what you say is true socrates but the name in my opinion is really most expressive of the power of the god hermogenes how so socrates i will endeavour to explain for i do not believe that any single name could have been better adapted to express the attributes of the god embracing and in a manner signifying all four of them music and prophecy and medicine and archery hermogenes that must be a strange name and i should like to hear the explanation socrates say rather an harmonious name as beseems the god of harmony in the first place the purgations and purifications which doctors and diviners use and their fumigations with drugs magical or medicinal as well as their washings and lustral sprinklings have all one and the same object which is to make a man pure both in body and soul hermogenes very true socrates and is not apollo the purifier and the washer and the absolver from all impurities hermogenes very true socrates then in reference to his ablutions and absolutions as being the physician who orders them he may be rightly called apolluan purifier or in respect of his powers of divination and his truth and sincerity which is the same as truth he may be most fitly called haplos from haplus sincere as in the thessalian dialect for all the thessalians call him haplos also he is aibalon always shooting because he is a master archer who never misses or again the name may refer to his musical attributes and then as in akolthos and akoitis and in many other words the alpha is supposed to mean together so the meaning of the name apollo will be moving together whether in the poles of heaven as they are called or in the harmony of song which is termed concord because he moves all together by an harmonious power as astronomers and musicians ingeniously declare and he is the god who presides over harmony and makes all things move together both among gods and among men and as in the words akolusos and akoitis the alpha is substituted for an omicron so the name apollon is equivalent to homopolon only the second lambda is added in order to avoid the ill-omened sound of destruction apollon now the suspicion of this destructive power still haunts the minds of some who do not consider the true value of the name which as i was saying just now has reference to all the powers of the god who is the single one the ever darting the purifier the mover together haplus aibolon apolluon demopolon the name of the muses and of music would seem to be derived from their making philosophical inquiries Mostai, and Lido is called by this name because she is such a gentle goddess and so willing Ethelimon, to grant our requests or her name may be letho as she is often called by strangers they seem to imply by it her amiability and her smooth and easy-going way of behaving artemis is named from her healthy artemis well-ordered nature and 
because of her love of virginity, perhaps because she is a proficient in virtue, arete, and perhaps also as hating intercourse of the sexes. Ton eraton misesasa. He who gave the goddess her name may have had any or all of these reasons. Hermogenes, what is the meaning of Dionysus and Aphrodite? Socrates, son of Hipponicus, you ask a solemn question. There is a serious and also a facetious explanation of both these names. The serious explanation is not to be had from me, but there is no objection to your hearing the facetious one, for the gods too love a joke. Dionysus is simply Didus Oinon, giver of wine. Didoinusos, as he might be called in fun, and Oinos is properly Oinus, because wine makes those who drink think. Oyasthai, that they have a mind, noon, when they have none. The derivation of Aphrodite, born of the foam, Aphros, may be fairly accepted on the authority of Hesiod. Hermogenes, still there remains Athene, whom you, Socrates, as an Athenian, will surely not forget. There are also Hephaestus and Ares. Socrates, I am not likely to forget them. Hermogenes, no indeed. Socrates, there is no difficulty in explaining the other appellation of Athene. Hermogenes, what other appellation? Socrates, we call her Pallas. Hermogenes, to be sure. Socrates, and we cannot be wrong in supposing that this is derived from armed dances, for the elevation of oneself or anything else above the earth, or by the use of the hands, we call shaking, palin, or dancing. Hermogenes, that is quite true. Socrates, then that is the explanation of the name Pallas? Hermogenes, yes, but what do you say of the other name? Socrates, Athene? Hermogenes, yes. Socrates, that is a graver matter, and there, my friend, the modern interpreters of Homer may, I think, assist in explaining the view of the ancients. For most of these, in their explanations of the poet, assert that he meant by Athene, mind, nous, and intelligence, dianoia, and the maker of names appears to have had a singular notion about her, and indeed calls her by a still higher title, divine intelligence, theu noesis, as though he would say, this is she who has the mind of God, theonoa, using alpha as a dialectical variety for eta, and taking away iota and sigma. Perhaps, however, the name theonoi may mean she who knows divine things, thea noosa better than others, nor shall we be far wrong in supposing that the author of it wished to identify this goddess with moral intelligence, in ethe noesin, and therefore gave her the name ethonoe, which, however, either he or his successors have altered into what they thought a nicer form, and call her Athene. Hermogenes, but what do you say of Hephaestus? Socrates, speak you of the princely lord of light? Pheos Histora? Hermogenes, surely. Socrates, Hephaestus is Hephaestus, and has added the Ada by attraction. That is obvious to anybody. Hermogenes, that is very probable, until some more probable notion gets into your head. Socrates, to prevent which you had better ask what is the derivation of Ares. Hermogenes, what is Ares? Socrates, Ares may be called, if you will, from his manhood, Aden, and manliness, or, if you please, from his hard and unchangeable nature, which is the meaning of Aratos. The latter is a derivation in every way appropriate to the god of war. Hermogenes, very true. Socrates, and now, by the gods, let us have no more of the gods, for I am afraid of them. Ask about anything but them, and thou shalt see how the steeds of Euthyphro can prance. Hermogenes, only one more god. I should like to know about Hermes, of whom I am said not to be a true son. 
let us make him out and then i shall know whether there is any meaning in what cratylus says socrates i should imagine that the name hermes has to do with speech and signifies that he is the interpreter hermenes or messenger or thief or liar or bargainer all that sort of thing has a great deal to do with language as i was telling you the word erin is expressive of the use of speech and there is an often recurring homeric word emesito which means he contrived out of these two words erin and mesasthai the legislator formed the name of the god who invented language and speech and we may imagine him dictating to us the use of this name o oh, my friends says he to us seeing that he is the contriver of tales or speeches you may rightly call him edemis and this has been improved by us as we think into hermes iris also appears to have been called from the verb to tell erin because she was a messenger hermogenes then i am very sure that cratylus was quite right in saying that i was no true son of hermes hermogenes for i am not a good hand at speeches socrates there is also reason my friend in pan being the double formed son of hermes hermogenes how do you make that out socrates as you are aware speech signifies all things pan and is always making them go round in a circle and has two forms true and false hermogenes certainly socrates is not the truth that is in him the smooth or sacred form which dwells above among the gods whereas falsehood dwells among men below and is rough like the goat of tragedy for tales and falsehoods have generally to do with the tragic or goatish life and tragedy is the place of them hermogenes very true socrates then surely pan who is the declarer of all things pan and the perpetual mover i polon of all things is rightly called ipolos goat herd he being the two-formed son of hermes smooth in his upper part and rough and goat-like in his lower regions and as the son of hermes he is speech or the brother of speech and that brother should be like brother is no marvel but as i was saying my dear hermogenes let us get away from the gods hermogenes from these sort of gods by all means socrates and of part two of cratylus recording in memory of mitchell edwards part three of cratylus by plato translated by benjamin joet this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards hermogenes but why should we not discuss another kind of gods the sun moon stars earth ether air fire water the seasons and the year socrates you impose a great many tasks upon me still if you wish i will not refuse hermogenes you will oblige me socrates how would you have me begin shall i take first of all him whom you mentioned first the sun hermogenes very good socrates the origin of the sun will probably be clearer in the doric form for the dorians call him halios and this name is given to him because when he rises he gathers halizoi men together or because he is always rolling in his course i elen eon about the earth or from iolen of which the meaning is the same as poikilen to variegate because he variegates the productions of the earth hermogenes but what is selene the moon socrates that name is rather unfortunate for anaxagoras hermogenes how so socrates the word seems to forestall his recent discovery that the moon receives her light from the sun hermogenes why do you say so socrates the two words celus brightness and phos light 
have much the same meaning? Hermogenes. Yes. Socrates. This light about the moon is always new, neon, and always old, henon, if the disciples of Anaxagoras say truly, for the sun in his revolution always adds new light, and there is the old light of the previous month. Hermogenes. Very true. Socrates. The moon is not unfrequently called Selenia. Hermogenes. True. Socrates. And as she has a light which is always old and always new, Henon, Neon, I, she may very properly have the name Seleenon Eaea, and this, when hammered into shape, becomes Selenia. Hermogenes. A real dithyrambic sort of name that, Socrates. But what do you say of the month and the stars? Socrates. Mace, month, is called from Meusthai, to lessen, because suffering diminution, the name of Astra, stars, seems to be derived from Astrape, which is an improvement on Anastrape, signifying the upsetting of the eyes, Anastrephane, Oppa. Hermogenes, what do you say of Pur, fire, and Hudar, water? Socrates, I am at a loss how to explain Pur. Either the muse of Euthyphro has deserted me, or there is some very great difficulty in the word. Please, however, to note the contrivance which I adopt whenever I am in a difficulty of this sort. Hermogenes, what is it? Socrates, I will tell you, but I should like to know first whether you can tell me what is the meaning of the word pur. Hermogenes, indeed, I cannot. Socrates, shall I tell you what I suspect to be the true explanation of this and several other words? My belief is that they are of foreign origin, for the Hellenes, especially those who were under the dominion of the barbarians, often borrowed from them. Hermogenes, what is the inference? Socrates, why, you know, that any one who seeks to demonstrate the fitness of these names according to the Hellenic language, and not according to the language from which the words are derived, is rather likely to be at fault. Hermogenes. Yes, certainly. Socrates. Well, then, consider whether this poor is not foreign, for the word is not easily brought into relation with the Hellenic tongue, and the Phrygians may be observed to have the same word slightly changed just as they have hudar, water, and kunas, dogs, and many other words. Hermogenes, that is true. Socrates, any violent interpretations of the words should be avoided, for something to say about them may easily be found. And thus I get rid of pur and hudar. Air, air, Hermogenes, may be explained as the element which raises aere, things from the earth, or as ever-flowing, aere, or because the flux of the air is wind, and the poets call the winds air-blasts, aitai. He who uses the term may mean, so to speak, air-flux, aitorun, in the sense of wind-flux, pneumatorun, and because this moving wind may be expressed by either term he employs the word air. Air equals aites rea. Aether, ether, I should interpret as aether. This may be correctly said, because this element is always running in a flux about the air. Ai the peri ton era reon. The meaning of the word gay, earth, comes out better when in the form of Gaia, for the earth may be truly called mother. Gaia, Genetera. As in the language of Homer, Gegasi means Gegenesthai. Hermogenes, good. Socrates, what shall we take next? Hermogenes, there are Aurai, the seasons, and the two names of the year, Eniautos and Etos. Socrates, the odd I should be spelt in the old Attic way if you desire to know the probable truth about them. 
they are rightly called horai because they divide horizusin the summers and winters and winds and the fruits of the earth the words eniautos and etos appear to be the same that which brings to light the plants and growths of the earth in their turn and passes them in review within itself and heota exetase this is broken up into two words eneotos from en heota and etos from etase just as the original name of zels was divided into zena and dia and the whole proposition means that this power of reviewing from within is one but has two names two words etos and eniautos being thus formed out of a single proposition hermogenes indeed socrates you make surprising progress socrates i am run away with hermogenes very true socrates but am not yet at my utmost speed hermogenes i should like very much to know in the next place how you would explain the virtues what principle of correctness is there in those charming words wisdom understanding justice and the rest of them socrates that is a tremendous class of names which you are disinterring still as i have put on the lion's skin i must not be faint of heart and i suppose that i must consider the meaning of wisdom phronesis and understanding sunesis and judgment name and knowledge episteme and all those other charming words as you call them hermogenes surely we must not leave off until we find out their meaning socrates by the dog of egypt i have not a bad notion which came into my head only this moment i believe that the prime evil givers of names were undoubtedly like too many of our modern philosophers who in their search after the nature of things are always getting dizzy from constantly going round and round and then they imagine that the world is going round and round and moving in all directions and this appearance which arises out of their own internal condition they suppose to be a reality of nature they think that there is nothing stable or permanent but only flux and motion and that the world is always full of every sort of motion and change the consideration of the whole class of names which i have mentioned has led me into making this reflection hermogenes how so socrates socrates perhaps you did not observe that in the names which have been just cited the motion or flux or generation of things is most surely indicated hermogenes no indeed i never thought of it socrates take the first of those which you mentioned clearly that is a name indicative of motion hermogenes what was the name socrates phronesis wisdom which may signify foras kairu noesis perception of motion and flux or perhaps foras onesis the blessing of motion but is at any rate connected with pherisai motion name judgment again certainly implies the ponderation or consideration namesis of generation for to ponder is the same as to consider or if you would rather here is noesis the very word just now mentioned which is neu hesis the desire of the new the word neos implies that the world is always in process of creation the giver of the name wanted to express this longing of the soul for the original name was neoesis and not noesis but eta took the place of a double epsilon the word sophrosune is the salvation soteria of that wisdom phronesis which we were just now considering episteme knowledge is akin to this and indicates that the soul which is good for anything follows hepatai the motion of things neither anticipating them nor falling behind them wherefore the word should rather be read as epistemene inserting in 
Sunesis, understanding, may be regarded in like manner as a kind of conclusion. The word is derived from Sunianai, to go along with, and, like Epistasthai, to know, implies the progression of the soul in company with the nature of things. Sophia, wisdom, is very dark, and appears not to be of native growth. The meaning is, touching the motion or stream of things. You must remember that the poets, when they speak of the commencement of any rapid motion, often use the word, esuthe, he rushed. And there was a famous Lacedaemonian who was named Seuss, rush, for by this word the Lacedaemonians signify rapid motion, and the touching, epaphe, of motion is expressed by Sophia, for all things are supposed to be in motion. Good, Agathon, is the name which is given to the admirable Agasta in nature, for although all things move, still there are degrees of motion. Some are swifter, some slower, but there are some things which are admirable for their swiftness, and this admirable part of nature is called Agathon. Dikaiosune, justice, is clearly Dikaiu sunesis, understanding of the just, but the actual word, Dikaion, is more difficult. Men are only agreed to a certain extent about justice, and then they begin to disagree, for those who suppose all things to be in motion conceive the greater part of nature to be a mere receptacle, and they say that there is a penetrating power which passes through all this, and is the instrument of creation in all, and is the subtlest and swiftest element, for if it were not the subtlest, and a power which none can keep out, and also the swiftest, passing by other things as if they were standing still, it could not penetrate through the moving universe. And this element which superintends all things and pierces, the ion, all, is rightly called the chion. The letter kappa is only added for the sake of euphony. Thus far, as I was saying, there is a general agreement about the nature of justice. But I, Hermogenes, being an enthusiastic disciple, have been told, in a mystery, that the justice of which I am speaking is also the cause of the world. Now a cause is that because of which anything is created, and someone comes and whispers in my ear that justice is rightly so called because partaking of the nature of the cause, and I begin, after hearing what he has said, to interrogate him gently. Well, my excellent friend, say I, but if all this be true, I still want to know what is justice. Thereupon they think that I ask tiresome questions, and am leaping over the barriers, and have been already sufficiently answered, and they try to satisfy me with one derivation after another, and at length they quarrel. For one of them says that justice is the sun, and that he, and none other, with his penetrating, dianta, and burning, kaonta, force, is the guardian of nature. And, when I joyfully repeat this beautiful notion, I am answered by the satirical remark, What, is there no justice in the world when the sun is down? And, when I earnestly beg my questioner to tell me his own honest opinion, he says, Fire, in the abstract, but this is not very intelligible. Another says, No, not fire in the abstract, but the abstraction of heat in the fire. Another man professes to laugh at all this and says, as Anaxagoras says, that justice is mind, for mind, as they say, has absolute power, and mixes with nothing, and orders all things, and passes through all things. At last, my friend, I find myself in far greater perplexity about the nature of justice than I was before I began to learn. But still, I am of opinion that the name which has led me into this digression was given to justice for the reasons which I have mentioned. Hermogenes, I think, Socrates, that you are not improvising now. You must have heard this from someone else. Socrates, and not the rest? Hermogenes, hardly. Socrates, well then, let me go on in the hope of making you believe in the originality of the rest. What remains after justice? I do not think that we have as yet discussed courage. Andrea, 
injustice, adikia, which is obviously nothing more than a hindrance to the penetrating principle, diantos, need not be considered. Well, then, the name of Andrea seems to imply a battle. This battle is in the world of existence, and, according to the doctrine of flux, is only the counterflux, enantia proe. If you extract the delta from Andrea, the name at once signifies the thing, and you may clearly understand that Andrea is not the stream opposed to every stream, but only to that which is contrary to justice for otherwise courage would not have been praised. The words aren, male, and aner, man, also contain a similar allusion to the same principle of the upward flux. Te ana proe, gune, woman, I suspect to be the same word as gone, birth. Thelu, female, appears to be partly derived from thele, the teat because the teat is like rain, and makes things flourish. Tethelenai. Hermogenes. That is surely probable. Socrates. Yes, and the very word, thalein, to flourish, seems to figure the growth of youth, which is swift and sudden ever, and this is expressed by the legislator in the name, which is a compound of thane, running, and halesthai, leaping. Pray observe how I gallop away when I get on smooth ground. There are a good many names, generally thought to be of importance, which have still to be explained. Hermogenes. True. Socrates. There is the meaning of the word techne, art, for example. Hermogenes. Very true. Socrates. Which may be identified with econoe, and expresses the possession of mind you have only to take away the tau and insert two omicrons, one between the chi and nu, and another between the nu and eta. Hermogenes, that is a very shabby etymology. Socrates, yes, my dear friend, but then you know that the original names have been long ago buried and disguised by people sticking on and stripping off letters for the sake of euphony, and twisting, and bedizening them in all sorts of ways. And time, too, may have had a share in the change. Take, for example, the word katoptron. Why is the letter rho inserted? This must surely be the addition of some one who cares nothing about the truth, but thinks only of putting the mouth into shape. And the additions are often such that at last no human being can possibly make out the original meaning of the word. Another example is the word sphinx, sphigos, which ought properly to be sphinx, phigos. And there are other examples. Hermogenes. That is quite true, Socrates. Socrates. And yet, if you are permitted to put in and pull out any letters which you please, names will be too easily made, and any name may be adapted to any object. Hermogenes. True. Socrates. Yes, that is true. And therefore a wise dictator, like yourself, should observe the laws of moderation and probability. Hermogenes. Such is my desire. Socrates. And mine too, Hermogenes. But do not be too much of a precision, or you will unnerve me of my strength. When you have allowed me to add mechane, contrivance, to techne, art, I shall be at the top of my bent, for I conceive mechane to be a sign of great accomplishment, anin, for mekos has the meaning of greatness, and these two, mekos and anin, make up the word mechane. But, as I was saying, being now at the top of my bent, I should like to consider the meaning of the two words, arete, virtue, and kakia, vice. Arete, I do not as yet understand, but kakia is transparent, and agrees with the principles which preceded. For all things being in flux, ionton, kakia is kakos ion, going badly 
and this evil motion when existing in the soul has the general name of kakia or vice specially appropriated to it the meaning of kakos ianai may be further illustrated by the use of delia cowardice which ought to have come after andrea but was forgotten and as i fear is not the only word which has been passed over delia signifies that the soul is bound with a strong chain desmos for lian means strength and therefore delia expresses the greatest and strongest bond of the soul and aporia difficulty is an evil of the same nature from alpha not and porlesthi to go like anything else which is an impediment to motion and movement then the word kakia appears to mean kakos ianai or going badly or limping and halting of which the consequence is that the soul becomes filled with vice and if kakia is the name of this sort of thing arete will be the opposite of it signifying in the first place ease of motion then that the stream of the good soul is unimpeded and has therefore the attribute of ever flowing without let or hindrance and is therefore called arete or more correctly airete ever flowing and may perhaps have had another form hairete eligible indicating that nothing is more eligible than virtue and this has been hammered into arete i dare say that you will deem this to be another invention of mine but i think that if the previous word kakia was right then arete is also right hermogenes but what is the meaning of kakon which has played so great a part in your previous discourse socrates that is a very singular word about which i can hardly form an opinion and therefore i must have recourse to my ingenious device hermogenes what device socrates the device of a foreign origin which i shall give to this word also hermogenes very likely you are right but suppose that we leave these words and endeavour to see the rationale of kalon and aiskron socrates the meaning of aiskron is evident being only ai iskon rois always preventing from flowing and this is in accordance with our former derivations for the name-giver was a great enemy to stagnation of all sorts and hence he gave the name aiskorun to that which hindered the flux ai iskon run and this is now beaten together into aiskron hermogenes but what do you say of kalon socrates that is more obscure yet the form is only due to the quantity and has been changed by altering omicron upsilon into omicron hermogenes what do you mean socrates this name appears to denote mind hermogenes how so socrates let me ask you what is the cause why anything has a name is not the principle which imposes the name the cause hermogenes certainly socrates and must not this be the mind of gods or of men or of both hermogenes yes socrates is not mind that which called kalesan things by their names and is not mind the beautiful kalon hermogenes that is evident socrates and are not the works of intelligence and mind worthy of praise and are not other works worthy of blame hermogenes certainly socrates physic does the work of a physician and carpentering does the works of a carpenter hermogenes exactly socrates and the principle of beauty does the works of beauty hermogenes of course socrates and that principle we affirm to be mind hermogenes very true socrates then mind is rightly called beauty because she does the works which we recognize and speak of as the beautiful hermogenes that is evident socrates what more names remain to us hermogenes there are the words which are connected with agathon and kalon such as 
Zumferon, and Lucitellun, Ophelimon, Cardalion, and their opposites. Socrates, the meaning of Zumferon, expedient, I think, that you may discover for yourself by the light of the previous examples, for it is a sister word to episteme, meaning just the motion, phora, of the soul accompanying the world, and things which are done upon this principle are called sumphora or sumferonta, because they are carried round with the world. Hermogenes, that is probable. Socrates, again, cardalion, gainful, is called from kerdos, gain. But you must alter the delta into nu if you want to get at the meaning, for this word also signifies good. But in another way, he who gave the name intended to express the power of admixture, keranumenon, and universal penetration in the good. In forming the word, however, he inserted a delta instead of a nu, and so made kedos. Hermogenes, well, but what is lucitellun? profitable. Socrates, I suppose, Hermogenes, that people do not mean by the profitable, the gainful, or that which pays, lue, the retailer, but they use the word in the sense of swift. You regard the profitable, lucitellun, as that which, being the swiftest thing in existence, allows of no stay in things, and no pause or end of motion, but always, if there begins to be any end, lets things go again, lue, and makes motion immortal and unceasing. And in this point of view, as appears to me, the good is happily denominated lucitellun, being that which luces, luon, the end, telos, of motion. Ophelimon, the advantageous, is derived from ophelin, meaning that which creates and increases. This latter is a common Homeric word, and has a foreign character. Hermogenes, and what do you say of their opposites? Socrates, of such as are mere negatives, I hardly think that I need speak. Hermogenes, which are they? Socrates, the words, axumphoron, inexpedient, anophelis, unprofitable, alusiteles, unadvantageous, akerdes, ungainful. Hermogenes. True. Socrates. I would rather take the words, blabberon, harmful, semiades, hurtful. Hermogenes. Good. Socrates. The word blabberon is that which is said to hinder or harm, blaptein, the stream, hrun. Blapton is, bulomenon, haptein, seeking to hold or bind, for haptein is the same as Dain, and Dain is always a term of censure. Bulomenon haptin run, wanting to bind the stream, would properly be bulapterun, and this, as I imagine, is improved into blabberon. Hermogenes, you bring out curious results, Socrates, in the use of names, and when I hear the word bulapterun, I cannot help imagining that you are making your mouth into a flute and puffing away at some prelude to Athene. Socrates, that is the fault of the makers of the name Hermogenes, not mine. Hermogenes, very true. But what is the derivation of Zemiades? Socrates, what is the meaning of Zemiades? Let me remark, Hermogenes, how right I was in saying that great changes are made in the meaning of words by putting in and pulling out letters even a very slight permutation will sometimes give an entirely opposite sense. I may instance the word deon, which occurs to me at the moment, and reminds me of what I was going to say to you, that the fine, fashionable language of modern times has twisted and disguised and entirely altered the original meaning both of deon and also of semiades, which in the old language is clearly indicated. Hermogenes, what do you mean? Socrates, I will try to explain. You are aware that our forefathers loved the sounds iota and delta, especially the women who are most conservative of the ancient language. But now they change iota into eta or epsilon, and delta into zeta. 
this is supposed to increase the grandeur of the sound hermogenes how do you mean socrates for example in very ancient times they called the day either himera or hemera which is called by us hemera hermogenes that is true socrates do you observe that only the ancient form shows the intention of the giver of the name of which the reason is that men long for himerusi and love the light which comes after the darkness and is therefore called himera from himeros desire hermogenes clearly socrates but now the name is so travestied that you cannot tell the meaning although there are some who imagine the day to be called himera because it makes things gentle himera hermogenes such is my view socrates and do you know that the ancients said duogon and not zugon hermogenes they did so socrates and zugon yoke has no meaning it ought to be duogon which word expresses the binding of two together duane agoge for the purpose of drawing this has been changed into zugon and there are many other examples of similar changes hermogenes there are socrates proceeding in the same train of thought i may remark that the word deon obligation has a meaning which is the opposite of all the other appellations of good for deon is here a species of good and is nevertheless the chain desmos or hinderer of motion and therefore own brother of blaberon hermogenes yes socrates that is quite plain socrates not if you restore the ancient form which is more likely to be the correct one and read dion instead of deon if you convert the epsilon into an iota after the old fashion this word will then agree with other words meaning good for dion not deon signifies the good and is a term of praise and the author of names has not contradicted himself but in all these various appellations deon obligatory ophelimon advantageous lucitellun profitable cerdaleon gainful agathon good sumphiron expedient elporon plenteous the same conception is implied of the ordering or all-pervading principle which is praised and the restraining and binding principle which is censured and this is further illustrated by the word semiades hurtful which if the zeta is only changed into delta as in the ancient language becomes demiades and this name as you will perceive is given to that which binds motion dunti eon and of part three of cratylus recording in memory of mitchell edwards Part four of Cratylus by Plato Translated by Benjamin Joet This Librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Geoffrey Edwards Hermogenes What do you say of Hedone pleasure Lupe pain Epithumia desire and the like Socrates Socrates I do not think, Hermogenes, that there is any great difficulty about them. Hedone is, he, onesis, the action which tends to advantage, and the original form may be supposed to have been heone, but this has been altered by the insertion of the delta. Lupe appears to be derived from the relaxation, luen, which the body feels when in sorrow. Ania, trouble is the hindrance of motion alpha and eoni algedon distress if i am not mistaken is a foreign word which is derived from algenos grievous odenai grief is called from the putting on induces sorrow in acthedon vexation the word too labours as any one may see 
kara joy is the very expression of the fluency and diffusion of the soul keo terpsis delight is so called from the pleasure creeping herpon through the soul which may be likened to a breath pnoe and is properly herpnun but has been altered by time into terpnon euphrosune cheerfulness and epithumia explain themselves the former which ought to be euphrosune and has been changed into euphrosune is named as every one may see from the soul moving pheresthai in harmony with nature epithumia is really he epiton thumon yusa dunamis the power which enters into the soul thumos passion is called from the rushing thuseos and boiling of the soul Himeros, desire denotes the stream prus which most draws the soul dia ten hesin tes prois because flowing with desire himenos and expresses a longing after things and violent attraction of the soul to them and is termed himeros from possessing this power pothos longing is expressive of the desire of that which is not present but absent and in another place pu this is the reason why the name pothos is applied to things absent as himeros is to things present eros love is so called because flowing in esron from without the stream is not inherent but is an influence introduced through the eyes and from flowing in was called esros influx in the old time when they used omicron for omega and is called eros now that omega is substituted for omicron but why do you not give me another word hermogenes what do you think of doxa opinion and that class of words socrates doxa is either derived from dioxes pursuit and expresses the march of the soul in the pursuit of knowledge or from the shooting of a bow toxon the latter is more likely and is confirmed by oasis thinking which is only oasis moving and implies the movement of the soul to the essential nature of each thing just as bule counsel has to do with shooting bole and bulesthai to wish combines the notion of aiming and deliberating all these words seem to follow doxa and all involve the idea of shooting just as abulia absence of counsel on the other hand is a mishap or missing or mistaking of the mark or aim or proposal or object hermogenes you are quickening your pace now socrates socrates why yes the end i now dedicate to god not however until i have explained ananke necessity which ought to come next and hecusion the voluntary hecusion is certainly the yielding hekon and unresisting the notion implied is yielding and not opposing yielding as i was just now saying to that motion which is in accordance with our will but the necessary and resistant being contrary to our will implies error and ignorance the idea is taken from walking through a ravine which is impassable and rugged and overgrown and impedes motion and this is the derivation of the word anankion necessary an anke eon going through a ravine but while my strength lasts let us persevere and i hope that you will persevere with your questions hermogenes well then let me ask about the greatest and noblest such as aletheia truth and pseudos falsehood and on being not forgetting to inquire why the word onoma name which is the theme of our discussion has the name of onoma socrates you know the word maesthai to seek hermogenes yes meaning the same as zetain to inquire socrates the word onoma seems to be a compressed sentence signifying on who zetema being for which there is a search 
as is still more obvious in onomaston notable which states in so many words that real existence is that for which there is a seeking on who masma aletheia is also an agglomeration of thea ale divine wandering implying the divine motion of existence pseudos falsehood is the opposite of motion here is another ill name given by the legislator to stagnation and forced inaction which he compares to sleep eldain but the original meaning of the word is disguised by the addition of sai on and usia are eon with an iota broken off this agrees with the true principle for being on is also moving eon and the same may be said of not being which is likewise called not going ukion or uki on equals uk eon hermogenes you have hammered away at them manfully but suppose that some one were to say to you what is the word eon and what are rehon and dun show me their fitness socrates you mean to say how should i answer him hermogenes yes socrates one way of giving the appearance of an answer has been already suggested hermogenes what way socrates to say that names which we do not understand are of foreign origin and this is very likely the right answer and something of this kind may be true of them but also the original forms of words may have been lost in the lapse of ages names have been so twisted in all manner of ways that i should not be surprised if the old language when compared with that now in use would appear to us to be a barbarous tongue hermogenes very likely socrates yes very likely but still the inquiry demands our earnest attention and we must not flinch for we should remember that if a person go on analyzing names into words and inquiring also into the elements out of which the words are formed and keeps on always repeating this process he who has to answer him must at last give up the inquiry in despair hermogenes very true socrates and at what point ought he to lose heart and give up the inquiry must he not stop when he comes to the names which are the elements of all other names and sentences for these cannot be supposed to be made up of other names the word agathon good for example is as we were saying a compound of agastos admirable and thous swift and probably thous is made up of other elements and these again of others but if we take a word which is incapable of further resolution then we shall be right in saying that we have at last reached a primary element which need not be resolved any further hermogenes i believe you to be in the right socrates and suppose the names about which you are now asking should turn out to be primary elements must not their truth or law be examined according to some new method hermogenes very likely socrates quite so hermogenes all that has preceded would lead to this conclusion and if as i think the conclusion is true then i shall again say to you come and help me that i may not fall into some absurdity in stating the principle of primary names hermogenes let me hear and i will do my best to assist you socrates i think that you will acknowledge with me that one principle is applicable to all names primary as well as secondary when they are regarded simply as names there is no difference in them hermogenes certainly not socrates all the names that we have been explaining were intended to indicate the nature of things hermogenes of course socrates and that this is true of the primary quite as much as of the secondary names is implied in their being names hermogenes surely socrates but the secondary as i conceive derive their significance from the primary hermogenes that is evident socrates very good but then how do the primary names which precede analysis show the natures of things as far as they can be shown which they must do if they are to be real names and here i will ask you a question 
suppose that we had no voice or tongue and wanted to communicate with one another should we not like the deaf and dumb make signs with the hands and head and the rest of the body hermogenes there would be no choice socrates socrates we should imitate the nature of the thing the elevation of our hands to heaven would mean lightness and upwardness heaviness and downwardness would be expressed by letting them drop to the ground if we were describing the running of a horse or any other animal we should make our bodies and our gestures as like as we could to them hermogenes i do not see that we could do anything else socrates we could not for by bodily imitation only can the body ever express anything hermogenes very true socrates and when we want to express ourselves either with the voice or tongue or mouth the expression is simply their imitation of that which we want to express hermogenes it must be so i think socrates then a name is a vocal imitation of that which the vocal imitator names or imitates hermogenes i think so socrates nay my friend i am disposed to think that we have not reached the truth as yet hermogenes why not socrates because if we have we shall be obliged to admit that the people who imitate sheep or cocks or other animals name that which they imitate hermogenes quite true socrates then could i have been right in what i was saying hermogenes in my opinion no but i wish that you would tell me socrates what sort of an imitation is a name socrates in the first place i should reply not a musical imitation although that is also vocal nor again an imitation of what music imitates these in my judgment would not be naming let me put the matter as follows all objects have sound and figure and many have colour hermogenes certainly socrates but the art of naming appears not to be concerned with imitations of this kind the arts which have to do with them are music and drawing hermogenes true socrates again is there not an essence of each thing just as there is a colour or sound and is there not an essence of colour and sound as well as of anything else which may be said to have an essence hermogenes i should think so socrates well and if any one could express the essence of each thing in letters and syllables would he not express the nature of each thing hermogenes quite so socrates the musician and the painter were the two names which you gave to the two other imitators what will this imitator be called hermogenes i imagine socrates that he must be the namer or name-giver of whom we are in search socrates if this is true then i think that we are in a condition to consider the names proe stream eni to go skesis retention about which you were asking and we may see whether the namer has grasped the nature of them in letters and syllables in such a manner as to imitate the essence or not hermogenes very good socrates but are these the only primary names or are there others hermogenes there must be others socrates so i should expect but how shall we further analyze them and where does the imitator begin imitation of the essence is made by syllables and letters ought we not therefore first to separate the letters just as those who are beginning rhythm first distinguish the powers of elementary and then of compound sounds and when they have done so but not before they proceed to the consideration of rhythms hermogenes yes socrates must we not begin in the same way with letters first separating the vowels and then the consonants and mutes into classes according to the received distinctions of the learned also the semivowels which are neither vowels nor yet mutes and distinguishing into classes the vowels themselves and when we have perfected the classification of things we shall give them names and see whether as in the case of letters there are any classes to which they may all be referred and hence we shall see their natures and see too whether they have in them classes as there are in the letters and when we have well considered all this we shall know how to apply them to what they resemble whether one letter is used to denote one thing or whether there is to be an admixture of several of them 
just as in painting the painter who wants to depict anything sometimes uses purple only or any other color and sometimes mixes up several colors as his method is when he has to paint flesh color or anything of that kind he uses his colors as his figures appear to require them and so too we shall apply letters to the expression of objects either single letters when required or several letters and so we shall form syllables as they are called and from syllables make nouns and verbs and thus at last from the combinations of nouns and verbs arrive at language large and fair and whole and as the painter made a figure even so shall we make speech by the art of the namer or the rhetorician or by some other art not that i am literally speaking of ourselves but i was carried away meaning to say that this was the way in which not we but the ancients formed language and what they put together we must take to pieces in like manner if we are to attain a scientific view of the whole subject and we must see whether the primary and also whether the secondary elements are rightly given or not for if they are not the composition of them my dear hermogenes will be a sorry piece of work and in the wrong direction hermogenes that socrates i can quite believe socrates well but do you suppose that you will be able to analyze them in this way for i am certain that i should not hermogenes much less am i likely to be able socrates shall we leave them then or shall we seek to discover if we can something about them according to the measure of our ability saying by way of preface as i said before of the gods that of the truth about them we know nothing and do but entertain human notions of them and in this present inquiry let us say to ourselves before we proceed that the higher method is the one which we or others who would analyze language to any good purpose must follow but under the circumstances as men say we must do as well as we can what do you think hermogenes i very much approve socrates that objects should be imitated in letters and syllables and so find expression may appear ridiculous hermogenes but it cannot be avoided there is no better principle to which we can look for the truth of first names deprived of this we must have recourse to divine help like the tragic poets who in any perplexity have their gods waiting in the air and must get out of our difficulty in like fashion by saying that the gods gave the first names and therefore they are right this will be the best contrivance or perhaps that other notion may be even better still of deriving them from some barbarous people for the barbarians are older than we are or we may say that antiquity has cast a veil over them which is the same sort of excuse as the last for all these are not reasons but only ingenious excuses for having no reasons concerning the truth of words and yet any sort of ignorance of first or primitive names involves an ignorance of secondary words for they can only be explained by the primary clearly then the professor of languages should be able to give a very lucid explanation of first names or let him be assured he will only talk nonsense about the rest do you not suppose this to be true hermogenes certainly socrates socrates my first notions of original names are truly wild and ridiculous though i have no objection to impart them to you if you desire and i hope that you will communicate to me in return anything better which you may have hermogenes fear not i will do my best socrates in the first place the letter rho appears to me to be the general instrument expressing all motion kinesis but i have not yet explained the meaning of this latter word which is just iesis going for the letter eta was not in use among the ancients who only employed epsilon and the root is kien which is a foreign form the same as ienai and the old word kinesis will be correctly given as iesis in corresponding modern letters assuming this foreign root kien and allowing for the change of the eta in the insertion of the nu we have kinesis which should have been kienesis or hesis and stasis is the negative of ienai or hesis and has been improved into stasis now the letter rho 
as i was saying appears to the imposer of names an excellent instrument for the expression of motion and he frequently uses the letter for this purpose for example in the actual words hrein and hroi he represents motion by hro also in the words tromos trembling trachus rugged and again in words such as cruen strike throwing crush etikin bruise thruptain break kanmatazain crumble prumbain whirl of all these sorts of movements he generally finds an expression in the letter ro because as i imagine he had observed that the tongue was most agitated and least at rest in the pronunciation of this letter which he therefore used in order to express motion just as by the letter iota he expresses the subtle elements which pass through all things this is why he uses the letter iota as imitative of motion ianai hiasai and there is another class of letters phi psi sigma and zeta of which the pronunciation is accompanied by great expenditure of breath these are used in the imitation of such notions as psukron shivering zeon seething sesai to be shaken seismos shock and are always introduced by the giver of names when he wants to imitate what is pusades windy he seems to have thought that the closing and pressure of the tongue in the utterance of delta and tau was expressive of binding and rest in a place he further observed the liquid movement of lambda in the pronunciation of which the tongue slips and in this he found the expression of smoothness as in leos level and in the word olisthanin to slip itself liparon sleek in the word kalodes gluey and the like the heavier sound of gamma detained the slipping tongue and the union of the two gave the notion of a glutinous clammy nature as in gliskros glucos gloiades the new he observed to be sounded from within and therefore to have a notion of inwardness hence he introduced the sound in endon and entos alpha he assigned to the expression of size and eta of length because they are great letters omicron was the sign of roundness and therefore there is plenty of omicron mixed up in the word gongolon round thus did the legislator reducing all things into letters and syllables and impressing on them names and signs and out of them by imitation compounding other signs that is my view hermogenes of the truth of names but i should like to hear what cratylus has more to say hermogenes but socrates as i was telling you before cratylus mystifies me he says that there is a fitness of names but he never explains what is this fitness so that i cannot tell whether his obscurity is intended or not tell me now cratylus here in the presence of socrates do you agree in what socrates has been saying about names or have you something better of your own and if you have tell me what your view is and then you will either learn of socrates or socrates and i will learn of you cratylus well but surely hermogenes you do not suppose that you can learn or i explain any subject of importance all in a moment at any rate not such a subject as language which is perhaps the very greatest of all hermogenes no indeed but as hesiod says and i agree with him to add little to little is worth while and therefore if you think that you can add anything at all however small to our knowledge take a little trouble and oblige socrates and me too who certainly have a claim upon you socrates i am by no means positive cratylus in the view which hermogenes and myself have worked out and therefore do not hesitate to say what you think which if it be better than my own view i shall gladly accept and i should not be at all surprised to find that you have found some better notion for you have evidently reflected on these matters and have had teachers and if you have really a better theory of the truth of names you may count me in the number of your disciples cratylus you are right socrates in saying that i have made a study of these matters and i might possibly convert you into a disciple but i fear that the opposite is more probable 
and I already find myself moved to say to you what Achilles, in the prayers, says to Ajax. Illustrious Ajax, son of Telamon, lord of the people, you appear to have spoken in all things much to my mind. And you, Socrates, appear to me to be an oracle, and to give answers much to my mind, whether you are inspired by Euthyphro, or whether some muse may have long been an inhabitant of your breast, unconsciously to yourself. Socrates. Excellent Cratylus, I have long been wondering at my own wisdom. I cannot trust myself, and I think that I ought to stop and ask myself, what am I saying? For there is nothing worse than self-deception, when the deceiver is always at home and always with you. It is quite terrible, and therefore I ought often to retrace my steps, and endeavour to look fore and aft in the words of the aforesaid Homer. End of Part 4 of Cratylus Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards Part 5 of Cratylus by Plato Translated by Benjamin Joet This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Geoffrey Edwards Socrates And now let me see, where are we? Have we not been saying that the correct name indicates the nature of the thing? Has this proposition been sufficiently proven? Cratylus. Yes, Socrates, what you say, as I am disposed to think, is quite true. Socrates. Names, then, are given in order to instruct? Cratylus. Certainly. Socrates. And naming is an art and has artificers? Cratylus. Yes. Socrates. And who are they? Cratylus. The legislators, of whom you spoke at first. Socrates. And does this art grow up among men like other arts? Let me explain what I mean. Of painters, some are better and some worse. Cratylus. Yes. Socrates. The better painters execute their works, I mean their figures, better, and the worse execute them worse and of builders also the better sort build fairer houses and the worse build them worse cratylus true socrates and among legislators there are some who do their work better and some worse cratylus no there i do not agree with you socrates then you do not think that some laws are better and others worse cratylus no indeed socrates or that one name is better than another Cratylus, certainly not. Socrates, then all names are rightly imposed? Cratylus, yes, if they are names at all. Socrates, well, what do you say to the name of our friend Hermogenes, which was mentioned before? Assuming that he has nothing of the nature of Hermes in him, shall we say that this is a wrong name, or not his name at all? Cratylus, I should reply that Hermogenes is not his name at all, but only appears to be his, and is really the name of somebody else who has the nature which corresponds to it. Socrates, and if a man were to call him Hermogenes, would he not be even speaking falsely? For there may be a doubt whether you can call him Hermogenes if he is not. Cratylus, what do you mean? Socrates, are you maintaining that falsehood is impossible? For if this is your meaning, I should answer that there have been plenty of liars in all ages. Cratylus. Why, Socrates, how can a man say that which is not? Say something, and yet say nothing. For is not falsehood saying the thing which is not? Socrates. Your argument, friend, is too subtle for a man of my age. But I should like to know whether you are one of those philosophers who think that falsehood may be spoken but not said. Cratylus neither spoken nor said. Socrates, nor uttered nor addressed? For example, if a person saluting you in a foreign country were to take your hand and say, Hail, Athenian stranger, Hermogenes, son of Smicreon. These words, whether spoken, said, uttered, or addressed, would have no application to you, but only to our friend Hermogenes, or perhaps to nobody at all? Cratylus, in my opinion, Socrates, the speaker would only be talking nonsense. Socrates. Well, but that will be quite enough for me, if you will tell me whether the nonsense would be true or false, 
or partly true and partly false which is all that i want to know cratylus i should say that he would be putting himself in motion to no purpose and that his words would be an unmeaning sound like the noise of hammering at a brazen pot socrates but let us see cratylus whether we cannot find a meeting point for you would admit that the name is not the same with the thing named cratylus i should socrates and would you further acknowledge that the name is an imitation of the thing cratylus certainly socrates and you would say that pictures are also imitations of things but in another way cratylus yes socrates i believe you may be right but i do not rightly understand you please to say then whether both sorts of imitation i mean both pictures and words are not equally attributable and applicable to the things of which they are the imitation cratylus they are socrates first look at the matter thus you may attribute the likeness of the man to the man and of the woman to the woman and so on cratylus certainly socrates and conversely you may attribute the likeness of the man to the woman and of the woman to the man cratylus very true socrates and are both modes of assigning them right or only the first cratylus only the first socrates that is to say the mode of assignment which attributes to each that which belongs to them and is like them cratylus such is my view socrates now then as i am desirous that we being friends should have a good understanding about the argument let me state my view to you the first mode of assignment whether applied to figures or to names i call right and when applied to names only true as well as right and the other mode of giving and assigning the name which is unlike i call wrong and in the case of names false as well as wrong cratylus that may be true socrates in the case of pictures they may be wrongly assigned but not in the case of names must they not always be right socrates why what is the difference may i not go to a man and say to him this is your picture showing him his own likeness or perhaps the likeness of a woman and when i say show i mean bring before the sense of sight cratylus certainly socrates and may i not go to him again and say this is your name for the name like the picture is an imitation may i not say to him this is your name and may i not then bring to his sense of hearing the imitation of himself by saying this is a man or of a female of the human species by saying this is a woman as the case may be is not all that quite possible cratylus i would fain agree with you socrates and therefore i say granted socrates that is very good of you if i am right which need hardly be disputed at present but if i can assign names as well as pictures to objects the right assignment of them we may call truth and the wrong assignment of them falsehood now if there be such a wrong assignment of names there may also be a wrong or inappropriate assignment of verbs and if of names and verbs then of the sentences which are made up of them what do you say cratylus cratylus i agree and think that what you say is very true socrates and further primitive nouns may be compared to pictures and in pictures you may either give all the appropriate colors and figures or you may not give them all some may be wanting or there may be too many or too much of them may there not cratylus very true socrates and he who gives all gives a perfect picture or figure and he who takes away or adds also gives a picture or figure but not a good one cratylus yes socrates in like manner he who by syllables and letters imitates the nature of things if he gives all that is appropriate will produce a good image or in other words a name but if he subtracts or perhaps adds a little he will make an image but not a good one whence i infer that some names are well and others ill-made cratylus that is true socrates then the artist of names may be sometimes good or he may be bad cratylus 
Yes, Socrates. And this artist of names is called the legislator? Cratylus. Yes, Socrates. Then, like other artists, the legislator may be good or he may be bad. It must surely be so if our former admissions hold good. Cratylus. Very true, Socrates. But the case of language, you see, is different. For when by the help of grammar we assign the letters alpha or beta or any other letters to a certain name, then if we add or subtract or misplace a letter, the name which is written is not only written wrongly, but not written at all, and in any of these cases becomes other than a name. Socrates. But I doubt whether your view is altogether correct, Cratylus. Cratylus. How so? Socrates. I believe that what you say may be true about numbers, which must be just what they are, or not be at all. For example, the number ten at once becomes other than ten if a unit be added or subtracted, and so of any other number. But this does not apply to that which is qualitative, or to anything which is represented under an image. I should say rather that the image, if expressing in every point the entire reality, would no longer be an image. Let us suppose the existence of two objects. One of them shall be Cratylus, and the other the image of Cratylus. And we will suppose further that some god makes not only a representation, such as a painter would make of your outward form and color, but also creates an inward organization like yours, having the same warmth and softness, and into this infuses motion and soul and mind, such as you have, and in a word copies all your qualities, and places them by you in another form. Would you say that this was Cratylus, and the image of Cratylus, or that there were two Cratyluses? Cratylus. I should say that there were two Cratyluses. Socrates. Then you see, my friend, that we must find some other principle of truth in images, and also in names, and not insist that an image is no longer an image when something is added or subtracted. Do you not perceive that images are very far from having qualities which are the exact counterpart of the realities which they represent? Cratylus. Yes, I see. Socrates. But then, how ridiculous would be the effect of names on things if they were exactly the same with them? for they would be the doubles of them, and no one would be able to determine which were the names, and which were the realities. Cratylus. Quite true. Socrates. Then fear not, but have the courage to admit that one name may be correctly, and another incorrectly given, and do not insist that the name shall be exactly the same with the thing, but allow the occasional substitution of a wrong letter, and, if of a letter, also of a noun in a sentence and if of a noun in a sentence also of a sentence which is not appropriate to the matter and acknowledge that the thing may be named and described so long as the general character of the thing which you are describing is retained and this as you will remember was remarked by hermogenes and myself in the particular instance of the names of the letters cratylus yes i remember socrates good and when the general character is preserved even if some of the proper letters are wanting, still the thing is signified. Well, if all the letters are given, not well when only a few of them are given. I think that we had better admit this, lest we be punished like travellers in Aegina, who wander about the street late at night, and be likewise told by truth herself that we have arrived too late. Or, if not, you must find out some new notion of correctness of names, and no longer maintain that a name is the expression of a thing in letters or syllables, for if you say both, you will be inconsistent with yourself. Cratylus, I quite acknowledge, Socrates, what you say to be very reasonable. Socrates, then, as we are agreed thus far, let us ask ourselves whether a name rightly imposed ought not to have the proper letters. Cratylus, yes. Socrates, and the proper letters are those which are like the things? Cratylus. Yes. Socrates. Enough then of names which are rightly given, and in names which are incorrectly given, the greater part may be supposed to be made up of proper and similar letters, or there would be no likeness. 
but there will be likewise a part which is improper and spoils the beauty and formation of the word you would agree with me cratylus there would be no use socrates in my quarrelling with you since i cannot be satisfied that a name which is incorrectly given is a name at all socrates do you admit a name to be the representation of a thing cratylus yes i do socrates but do you not allow that some nouns are primitive and some derived cratylus yes i do socrates then if you admit that primitive or first nouns are representations of things is there any better way of framing representations than by assimilating them to the objects as much as you can or do you prefer the notion of hermogenes and of many others who say that names are conventional and have a meaning to those who have agreed about them and who have previous knowledge of the things intended by them and that convention is the only principle and whether you abide by our present convention or make a new and opposite one according to which you call small great and great small they would say that it makes no difference if you are only agreed which of these two notions do you prefer cratylus representation by likeness socrates is infinitely better than representation by any chance sign socrates very good but if the name is to be like the thing the letters out of which the first names are composed must also be like things returning to the image of the picture i would ask how could any one ever compose a picture which would be like anything at all if there were not pigments in nature which resembled the things imitated and out of which the picture is composed cratylus impossible socrates no more could names ever resemble any actually existing thing unless the original elements of which they are compounded bore some degree of resemblance to the objects of which the names are the imitation and the original elements are letters cratylus yes socrates let me now invite you to consider what hermogenes and i were saying about sounds do you agree with me that the letter pro is expressive of rapidity motion and hardness were we right or wrong in saying so cratylus i should say that you were right socrates and that lambda was expressive of smoothness and softness and the like cratylus there again you were right socrates and yet as you are aware that which is called by us sclerotes is by the eritreans called scleroter cratylus very true socrates but are the letters rho and sigma equivalents and is there the same significance to them in the termination rho which there is to us in sigma or is there no significance to one of us cratylus nay surely there is a significance to both of us socrates in as far as the two letters are like or in as far as they are unlike cratylus in as far as they are like socrates are they altogether alike cratylus yes for the purpose of expressing motion socrates and what do you say of the insertion of the lambda for that is expressive not of hardness but of softness cratylus why perhaps the letter lambda is wrongly inserted socrates and should be altered into pro as you were saying to hermogenes and in my opinion rightly when you spoke of adding and subtracting letters upon occasion socrates good but still the word is intelligible to both of us when i say skleros hard you know what i mean cratylus yes my dear friend and of this the explanation is custom socrates and what is custom but convention i utter a sound which i understand and you know that i understand the meaning of the sound this is what you are saying cratylus yes socrates and if when i speak you know my meaning there is an indication given by me to you cratylus yes socrates this indication of my meaning may proceed from unlike as well as from like for example in the lambda of sclerotes but if this is true then you have made a convention with yourself and the correctness of a name turns out to be convention since letters which are unlike are indicative equally with those which are like if they are sanctioned by custom and convention and even supposing that you distinguish custom from convention ever so much still you must say that the signification of words is given by custom 
and not by likeness for custom may indicate by the unlike as well as by the like but as we are agreed thus far cratylus for i shall assume that your silence gives consent then custom and convention must be supposed to contribute to the indication of our thoughts for suppose we take the instance of number how can you ever imagine my good friend that you will find names resembling every individual number unless you allow that which you term convention and agreement to have authority in determining the correctness of names i quite agree with you that words should as far as possible resemble things but i fear that this dragging in of resemblance as hermogenes says is a shabby thing which has to be supplemented by the mechanical aid of convention with a view to correctness for i believe that if we could always or almost always use likenesses which are perfectly appropriate this would be the most perfect state of language as the opposite is the most imperfect but let me ask you what is the force of names and what is the use of them cratylus the use of names socrates as i should imagine is to inform the simple truth is that he who knows names knows also the things which are expressed by them socrates i suppose you mean to say cratylus that as the name is so also is the thing and that he who knows the one will also know the other because they are similars and all similars fall under the same art or science and therefore you would say that he who knows names will also know things cratylus that is precisely what i mean socrates but let us consider what is the nature of this information about things which according to you is given us by names is it the best sort of information or is there any other what do you say cratylus i believe it to be both the only and the best sort of information about them there can be no other socrates but do you believe that in the discovery of them he who discovers the names discovers also the things or is this only the method of instruction and is there some other method of inquiry and discovery cratylus i certainly believe that the methods of inquiry and discovery are of the same nature as instruction socrates well but do you not see cratylus that he who follows names in the search after things and analyzes their meaning is in great danger of being deceived cratylus how so socrates why clearly he who first gave names gave them according to his conception of the things which they signified did he not cratylus true socrates and if his conception was erroneous and he gave names according to his conception in what position shall we who are his followers find ourselves shall we not be deceived by him cratylus but socrates am i not right in thinking that he must surely have known or else as i was saying his names would not be names at all and you have a clear proof that he has not missed the truth and the proof is that he is perfectly consistent did you ever observe in speaking that all the words which you utter have a common character and purpose socrates but that friend cratylus is no answer for if he did begin in error he may have forced the remainder into agreement with the original error and with himself there would be nothing strange in this any more than in geometrical diagrams which have often a slight and invisible flaw in the first part of the process and are consistently mistaken in the long deductions which follow and this is the reason why every man should expend his chief thought and attention on the consideration of first principles are they or are they not rightly laid down and when he has duly sifted them all the rest will follow now i should be astonished to find that names are really consistent and here let us revert to our former discussion were we not saying that all things are in motion and progress and flux and that this idea of motion is expressed by names do you not conceive that to be the meaning of them cratylus yes that is assuredly their meaning and the true meaning socrates let us revert to episteme knowledge and observe how ambiguous this word is seeming rather to signify stopping the soul at things than going round with them and therefore we should leave the beginning as at present and not reject the epsilon but make an insertion of an iota instead of an epsilon not pisteme but episteme 
take another example bebion sure is clearly the expression of station and position and not of motion again the word historia inquiry bears upon the face of it the stopping histanai of the stream and the word piston faithful certainly indicates cessation of motion then again meneme memory as any one may see expresses rest in the soul and not motion moreover words such as hamartia and sumphora which have a bad sense viewed in the light of their etymologies will be the same as sunesis and episteme and other words which have a good sense caeteris peribus hamartain sunianae hetesthai sumferesphai and much the same may be said of amthea and acolasia for amathea may be explained as he hamatheo iontos porea and acolasia as he acoluthia tois pragmasin thus the names which in these instances we find to have the worst sense will turn out to be framed on the same principle as those which have the best and any one i believe who would take the trouble might find many other examples in which the giver of names indicates not that things are in motion or progress but that they are at rest which is the opposite of motion cratylus yes socrates but observe the greater number express motion socrates what of that cratylus are we to count them like votes and is correctness of names the voice of the majority are we to say of whichever sort there are most those are the true ones cratylus no that is not reasonable socrates certainly not but let us have done with this question and proceed to another about which i should like to know whether you think with me were we not lately acknowledging that the first givers of names in states both hellenic and barbarous were the legislators and that the art which gave names was the art of the legislator cratylus quite true socrates tell me then did the first legislators who were the givers of the first names know or not know the things which they named cratylus they must have known socrates socrates why yes friend cratylus they could hardly have been ignorant cratylus i should say not socrates let us return to the point from which we digressed you were saying if you remember that he who gave names must have known the things which he named are you still of that opinion cratylus i am socrates and would you say that the giver of the first names had also a knowledge of the things which he named cratylus i should socrates but how could he have learned or discovered things from names if the primitive names were not yet given for if we are correct in our view the only way of learning and discovering things is either to discover names for ourselves or to learn them from others cratylus i think that there is a good deal in what you say socrates socrates but if things are only to be known through names how can we suppose that the givers of names had knowledge or were legislators before there were names at all and therefore before they could have known them cratylus i believe socrates the true account of the matter to be that a power more than human gave things their first names and that the names which are thus given are necessarily their true names socrates then how came the giver of the names if he was an inspired being or god to contradict himself for were we not saying just now that he made some names expressive of rest and others of motion were we mistaken cratylus but i suppose one of the two not to be names at all socrates and which then did he make my good friend those which are expressive of rest or those which are expressive of motion this is a point which as i said before cannot be determined by counting them cratylus no not in that way socrates socrates but if this is a battle of names some of them asserting that they are like the truth others contending that they are how or by what criterion are we to decide between them for there are no other names to which appeal can be made but obviously recourse must be had to another standard which without employing names will make clear which of the two are right and this must be a standard which shows the truth of things cratylus i agree socrates 
but if that is true cratylus then i suppose that things may be known without names cratylus clearly socrates but how would you expect to know them what other way can there be of knowing them except the true and natural way through their affinities when they are akin to each other and through themselves for that which is other and different from them must signify something other and different from them cratylus what you are saying is i think true socrates well but reflect have we not several times acknowledged that names rightly given are the likenesses and images of the things which they name cratylus yes socrates let us suppose that to any extent you please you can learn things through the medium of names and suppose also that you can learn them from the things themselves which is likely to be the nobler and clearer way to learn of the image whether the image and the truth of which the image is the expression have been rightly conceived or to learn of the truth whether the truth and the image of it have been duly executed cratylus i should say that we must learn of the truth socrates how real existence is to be studied or discovered is i suspect beyond you and me but we may admit so much that the knowledge of things is not to be derived from names no they must be studied and investigated in themselves cratylus clearly socrates socrates there is another point i should not like us to be imposed upon by the appearance of such a multitude of names all tending in the same direction i myself do not deny that the givers of names did really give them under the idea that all things were in motion and flux which was their sincere but i think mistaken opinion and having fallen into a kind of whirlpool themselves they are carried round and want to drag us in after them there is a matter master cratylus about which i often dream and should like to ask your opinion tell me whether there is or is not any absolute beauty or good or any other absolute existence cratylus certainly socrates i think so socrates then let us seek the true beauty not asking whether a face is fair or anything of that sort for all such things appear to be in a flux but let us ask whether the true beauty is not always beautiful cratylus certainly socrates and can we rightly speak of a beauty which is always passing away and is first this and then that must not the same thing be born and retire and vanish while the word is in our mouths cratylus undoubtedly socrates then how can that be a real thing which is never in the same state for obviously things which are the same cannot change while they remain the same and if they are always the same and in the same state and never depart from their original form they can never change or be moved cratylus certainly they cannot socrates nor yet can they be known by any one for at the moment that the observer approaches then they become other and of another nature so that you cannot get any further in knowing their nature or state for you cannot know that which has no state cratylus true socrates nor can we reasonably say cratylus that there is knowledge at all if everything is in a state of transition and there is nothing abiding for knowledge too cannot continue to be knowledge unless continuing always to abide and exist but if the very nature of knowledge changes at the time when the change occurs there will be no knowledge and if the transition is always going on there will always be no knowledge and according to this view there will be no one to know and nothing to be known but if that which knows and that which is known exists ever and the beautiful and the good and every other thing also exist then i do not think that they can resemble a process or flux as we were just now supposing whether there is this eternal nature in things or whether the truth is what heraclitus and his followers and many others say is a question hard to determine and no man of sense will like to put himself or the education of his mind in the power of names neither will he so far trust names or the givers of names as to be confident in any knowledge which condemns himself and other existences to an unhealthy state of unreality he will not believe that all things leak like a pot or imagine that the world is a man who has a running at the nose this may be true cratylus but is also very likely to be untrue and therefore i would not have you be too easily persuaded of it reflect well and like a man and do not easily accept such a doctrine for you are young and of an age to learn 
and when you have found the truth, come and tell me. Cratylus, I will do as you say, though I can assure you, Socrates, that I have been considering the matter already, and the result of a great deal of trouble and consideration is that I incline to Heraclitus. Socrates, then another day, my friend, when you come back, you shall give me a lesson, but at present go into the country as you are intending, and Hermogenes shall set you on your way. Cratylus, very good, Socrates. I hope, however, that you will continue to think about these things yourself. End of part five and end of Cratylus by Plato, translated by Benjamin Joet, read by Geoffrey Edwards, proof listened by Rapunzelina, meta coordinated by Anne Boulay, recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards.